Many of you are asking, when is the border going to open? And the answer is, I don't know. But let's try to dig in a little bit deeper, shall we? I don't know isn't good enough. What are the main pressures likely to open the New Zealand border to foreign skilled labor? Let's pose that question and have a look at some economic pressures that could come into play. So here's the economy of New Zealand. It's very commodity rich. If a country wants to import, they need to export. Foreign currency comes from exports, and then you can buy with that things to import. If you don't export, you don't import. If you export a lot, you have the power to import a lot or invest or do other things. Uh, but the two go hand in hand. It's a cycle, right? So a little bit about the export and import community, the trade community of New Zealand. Um, you can talk about these four areas here. Uh, one is Australasia, which is Australia and nearby Asia. Two is the Eastern and Southern Asia markets. That's also an arm. So you might see a thick arm here, a thick arm here, and we've got two more. One is going far away to the US, a little bit further. And another one is going quite a bit distance, big distance away to Europe. So these are the four arms. And obviously, the, this one has been growing in the middle here uh, as, as the rise of the East has been happening. It's just a reality. Just I want to point that out as one of those things that's happening uh, and continues to happen. So here's a little bit more about the trading partners. Um, the chart goes from bottom upwards. So China's the greatest trading partner, followed by Australia, followed by US, Japan, South Korea, and so on. Notice all the arrows here. That's in the zone that I was talking about here in the previous, this area here. This is the central main zone of trade. And you can see here how prominent these countries are. Just wanted to point that out. Now let's go to the COVID question. Uh, what I want to do in this slide is focus on the performance of manufacturing index. So I want to read this out. What is this about, this index, in the blue bars? As you see, what do these blue bars represent? Indicates activity in the New Zealand manufacturing sector based on production, new orders delivered, inventories, and employment. So we're looking at an index that weighs all of these factors within the economy and comes up with an indicator. So the indicator reading above 50 is an expansion of the manufacturing. I'm reading on, right? An expansion of the manufacturing sector compared to the previous month. Below 50 represents a contraction. So that means it's shrinking relative to the previous month. And 50 would indicate no change. So look at this. What I've done is I've put a black bar on 50. You see that 50 right there? That's, that's no change. Notice what happened. Here in the red circle is the COVID crash and bounce. It's a crash and bounce. It's a V-shaped crash and bounce. Two months going down, two months going up. COVID has hit the manufacturing sector of New Zealand and the COVID policies about you know the lockdowns and working and all that stuff it's totally over and manufacturing has completely recovered in fact it's growing at a steady rate which is a quite a strong rate if you ask me have a look at that rate so we have a strong manufacturing economy that has already returned to new zealand and uh, as far as the covid bump goes at the moment we can well and truly say it's behind us at the moment Things could change. Things always can change. At the moment, we have progressed onwards and we're growing now in the manufacturing sector as we have been before. And now compare that previous chart with the manufacturing bounce to what happened with immigration. So we obviously bring in talent from abroad in order to help us with our economy, which involves trade and uh, also internal domestic um, work. But it's all about the trade, isn't it? If you want to buy things abroad, you have to sell things to the abroad. So here we go. The economy of New Zealand is is um, is recovered. But what about the what about the immigrants? What about the skilled immigrants? Um, migrant arrivals are way down, 84 percent. Look at this drop. Let's look at the top top graph there, the blue one. 
It is migrant arrivals. Those are the ones coming here. Yellow is departures and red is net. It's an average. But I want to focus on the migrant arrivals for the moment. These are talent coming in. So the migrant arrivals are here and it's trending, you know, flat and then it's trending up and then crash and it's been down the full time from that point all the way till now. So here we haven't seen a recovery at all and the policies of COVID have not been corrected for this market. And we're still basically in a situation where borders have not allowed uh, the correction to happen. Okay, so where do these two worlds meet? Well, I would say that they would meet when the system of manufacturing requires additional talent to make it keep on functioning which is maintenance, or make it technologically grow and advance, which is you know the standard upgrades that any economy will have. How long will it take? I don't know, but there'll be a pressure in that zone, I reckon. Okay, so let's go to the next page here. Uh, this is a little bit of an addition before I had imports and exports. Now I'm showing also goods and services exports, because remember, New Zealand doesn't only export goods, which was the previous chart. It's still here. I've got the top exports here. These are the goods exports. But on the right side now, rather than imports, I've got goods and services exports. And this chart is a little bit old, forgive me, but I'll tell you what, it's, it's similar. It's quite similar. So let's have a look. The top one in 2008 was tourism. And then the second one was dairy. Well, it was, it was really close then, 18 and 18. And it's really close today. I, I mean, in 2019, in, in 2019, it was really close as well. Obviously now tourism is off the table, it's gone. So we've seen 18 to 20% of our market go away. One fifth of the foreign currency that New Zealand earns from exports in the form of goods and services, which is the total picture of exports, one fifth was in tourism and that is gone this year 2019 and it's continuing on 2020 now so what i want to bring out by explaining this is that you see this goods list because because this service of tourism is gone and we've got one fifth gone from our from our in, uh, income from the uh, abro uh foreign income that means we have additional pressure to make sure these don't fail us as well, because that's all we've got. We don't have any services anymore to offer to speak of, not on the high level, but we have these dairy, number one, meat, number two, wood, number three, fruits, number four, cereal and milk, number, and so on. These are these are the commodities that we rely on to get out the door. Now, let's have a look at how the commodity structure is so dependent on using New Zealand land, dairy, that's cows eating grass, meat, that's animals eating grass, wood, that's wood growing from the land, fruits, that's orchards living on the land, cereal milk, okay, at least you got the cereal there, beverages, that's coming from fruits, fish, that's coming from the ocean, uh, machinery, that's probably going to play a role in this, at least part of that, food and modified starches, so you, you see here how much dependency our exports are on the quality of the land productivity, uh, the New Zealand brand for quality goods, natural high value goods, and um, the fact that we don't have a high amount of um, people. So we have a lot of land compared to people, a lot of arable kilometers, farm, farming land compared to people. And uh, in order to get the imports, which largely go to help make the exports happen, we're going to have to export. So all these exports are needed to get all these imports. And I would also include that one of the inputs here, we have machinery. It's largely an input to make this export happen. Vehicles, I would say largely, not completely, but a significant amount of the vehicles are going to make these exports happen. Mineral fuels, once again, not completely. There'll be some domestic use only, but there also will be a significant amount of mineral fuels used to make this happen. Electrical machinery, same thing. 
plastics and packaging, same thing. And then we continue on articles of iron or steel. These are probably components fabricated to make sure these are manufactured and brought to the market. So you see the dependency here, it comes down on the land and the amount of quality land we have compared to the very few number of people that we have to consume, which means we get to export it all. So as long as we're exporting our surplus, we can import the things we need domestically to enjoy a quality of life, but also enjoy to make our exports happen more easily. And once again, I'd like to bring to the forefront, I don't see the new talent coming in this picture yet. So that's got to be a component. I don't think we can forget. It doesn't make mathematical sense to me that we can have a continuation of exports and just forget about the talent. Does that make sense? We're going to have to have upgrades and maintenance. Okay, so here we go. Um, this is the migrant settlement success by region. This is also very interesting because different regions of the world have different levels of migrant success, but I would say overall, everyone is successful. So this report represents the findings from the Longitudinal Immigration Survey. I thought it was quite interesting. New Zealand LISNZ interviewed the same cohort of migrants, six months, wave one, that's here, wave one, 18 months, wave two, that's here, wave two, and 36 months, wave three, that's wave three here, three years, six months, one and a half years, and three years, they were, they were um, surveyed. So the report is based on 5,144 migrants surveyed here, surveyed here, and surveyed here in three waves. Respondents were approved for residence this November 2004, right? So this is a historical survey. Then, uh, and, and so they describe uh, that process. And notice here, the successful settlement of migrants is largely, largely attributable to their ability to integrate into the receiving country, which is New Zealand, both socially and economically. So we're talking about jobs and satisfaction. Okay, and I don't know how it's all measured, but let's just assume that it's competently collected data. Okay, one of the government's priorities is to attract and retain migrants who will contribute to the employment needs of New Zealand's changing economy. Boom, there you go. That's it. So that's what they're looking for. One of the one of the main things they're looking for on the top of the list, you'll notice UK Irish Republic. All right. So this is on the top of the list. They integrate really well. Uh, that's the dark, it's the dark blue with the, with, the, with the long dotted line. Now we have a dark blue with the short dotted line, with this, which is South Africa, just below that. So these two are basically running parallel and they're the same, nearly the same. You can almost overlay them statistically, hardly a difference. They're on the top of the list. We have North America starting off on the top of the list, but then they, they go down at the bottom. So they're actually the trend is slightly down, ever so slightly. It's almost flat. But I, I, I guess what I can read from this is North Americans perhaps coming to New Zealand for all of those things that they wanted, and it's, the, and it's here, but then they may be missing some of those things that they left. They didn't think about maybe close to family and, and things like that. That, that's what I read into that, and I don't know details. But anyway, some changes. Generally, that's very positive. These people have integrated in by 85%, six months, one and a half years, and three years. I don't know what 85% means, 85% integrated. It doesn't mean that there's only 85% satisfied. It means that the indicator was 85% integrated um, both economically and socially. So uh, it looks very positive to me so far. And everyone looks very positive. I just say that all the groups are trending up. All the groups are rather tight around the 70s and 80s. There's a couple of exceptions. Uh, the Pacific trends below 70 to start with, but then trends up above 70. So it's got the steepest rise, okay? And then we have the North Asia having a drop. And I believe this is probably from uh, the group of people coming from war-torn zones up there. I've met, I've had the privilege and honor of working with some of these hardworking 
uh, beautiful people that uh, you can count on to arrive early, finish late, do good work, um, not create any problems with anyone, uh, very um, diligent in what they do and accurate in what they do. And some of the community struggles a lot with trauma. So I know that's a fact, and I know that they're from the uh, the North Asia. That's where this is, dot, is from, North Asia. But I can't say if that's the reason why this particular chart goes down. But it seems to me that what that means is New Zealand does well with them for the one, first one and a half years and then drops the ball for the second one and a half years. So probably some correction there on the New Zealand side. Hey, look, if you're going to commit to migrants from war-torn countries, you got to follow through a little bit more than what you do everyone else. Okay, so that's basically the story of where we are. I think if you are from one of these, if basically if you're from anywhere in the world, you're going to integrate in really well. And if you are from a war-torn country, you're not going to be coming here looking for work on your own accord. You don't have the wherewithal, the, the, the finances to do that. So it's basically everyone who's coming here on their own free will is going to do well on average, basically. That's what I'm reading in the statistics. Especially you who are from South Africa, you have a lot to be proud of. This is a consistent high-end effort on the par of Europe, and you do have a sort of a sense of being from a war-torn country in a way with the crisis, um, but at the same time, you integrate really high level, extremely high level. What is your ideal New Zealand border strategy? Well, you can't do anything to open it, but what you can do is prepare for it to open. So on the left, I've got situation analysis. On the right, I've got winning strategy. This is very simple. Number one on the situation, New Zealand border is closed for migrants, except for very select few people. If you're one of those, great, that's fantastic. For most of us, we're gonna have to wait for the border to open. The borders will either open to foreign skills or we will shrink our economy. It's as simple as that. So the winning strategy for you being a skilled foreign migrant is use this time wisely to prepare. Prepare your profile, prepare to engage the employer network, engage them, get a response from them, and schedule meetings in advance. This is what I help people do. So if you have any questions how that's done or how you can do it, please let me know, send your CV to me. Be part of the first wave of migrants in entering into New Zealand. Why? Because the first wave will be a magical moment where in comes the most proactive job seekers, generally the most talented and the most ready and the most prepared. They're gonna meet on the New Zealand side, the most proactive and prepared employers that have been waiting for this moment for a long time because they're trying to grow and they don't have the people here on the level that they need to grow. So if you are committed, this is the time. If you're not committed, okay, that's fine. You need to probably first sit back and understand whether you want to do this or not. But if you've already decided, now's the time.